wow, that was a long video. I'm gonna have to edit to make it not be long because this is actually kind of a complicated topic. Um, the bottom line is both these apps make great black and white, so does Photoshop, but I'm gonna show you the differences and we're gonna test it. You're out shooting, you're seeing the light and the shadow, you're like, hey, I'm going black and white, then what do you do with it? What's the best way to edit your black and white? Well, it's probably not to bake it in camera because then you have even less options than we did in the film days with color filters. You've thrown away all the information to be able to make that black and white be exactly the way you visualized it here. So should you use Lightroom? Is Lightroom better? Capture one? Or should you be leaving that raw conversion environment and doing something like Photoshop or some other layer-based editor? The primary objective of today's video is to compare how Lightroom handles black and white in comparison with how the latest version of Capture One handles black and white. They're both good apps. I'll tell you right up front, you can get great results. If you use any of my presets and products and things like that, you know that I get almost identical results in Lightroom and in Capture One, although sometimes it does take a lot of tinkering and work behind the scenes over here in the studio. I'm gonna put the Photoshop one on to kind of balance this out a little bit so you see what your options are to go a little further. But let's start first by just looking at Lightroom versus Capture One. Here's one taken down in the jungles of the Huasteca Potasi Potasina. <laughs> I I sometimes get my Mexico pronunciations incorrecto. This is obviously exposed a little dark. The first thing I'm gonna do is a baseline, just like I would in a grid edit, like I talk about in my workflow videos. I'm gonna put like, like 0.5. I really just underexposed it. Let's go to 0.5. Let's go back over to Capture One. I'm gonna take the same photo and you can see I have my interface set up right here with my panels on the left. Let's go to the adjust tab here and that's where I can adjust things like exposure, white balance, all that. Now, you can see if I do 0.5 on this, we bring it up a little bit here. And if I look at the two, they're very close. I've told you guys lots of times, if I'm going to black and white, I know kind of what I'm looking for here. But the first thing I'm gonna do is always use a preset or a style. Whether you use tools like my Silver 4 pack or my Filmist pack, or whether you're making your own, you need to be saving your formulas because there's certain combinations of things that just work on different styles of images, on different types of light. If you're not using my Silver presets, at least go grab the free pack because they give you some great starter formulas. It's not about not tweaking it yourself. It's about getting where you need to go more efficiently and letting you see more options. Let's start in Lightroom and just look at what we can do. If I were to go over this and say, no, this is a cool water scene. I want something that's maybe a little bit gritty. Let's do HDR Silver 3 here from Silver version 4.5, okay? And yeah, it looks good. It's super dark, but that's not always a bad thing. I'm gonna push my exposure. You can see the preset didn't mess with my exposure at all and no, no good preset or style should do that normally. I'm gonna push this up to about three quarters of a stop and now it's looking really good. We got rich contrastiness. It's nice, it's nice. Okay, so back here in Capture One, let's again start from scratch. I'm gonna bump up my exposure a little bit on the Capture One version as well again. And I'm gonna go to Styles and we're just gonna go down to the HDR Silver 3. I feel like we're pushing in this particular mix, it's our shadows that is, are being pushed a little too far. One thing I've noticed is that highlight are about the same in Capture One and Lightroom, but shadows can be a little more intense. Okay, so here's Lightroom and here is Capture One after the presets and just a few minor tweaks. All right, great. But today we wanna talk about less about the tone, the shadow and highlight features in the two of these apps. You can watch my other videos on Lightroom versus Capture One to see more things. I wanna focus on the black and white aspect. The biggest difference that I see in Lightroom versus Capture One is if you go to color. So when you go to color in the black and white tab, you can see here black and white is enabled. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six color sliders. You can see here that Lightroom actually has eight channels. Lightroom introduces the orange channel, okay? And you can see that Capture One does not have an orange channel. And Lightroom also has the purple and the magenta channels here. This is one of the biggest differences in processing these. And it's actually kind of a big deal, especially the orange. Maybe not the purple so much, but the orange slider 
represents flesh tones, and that actually affects it a lot. So here's a portrait, it's got a strobe, we've got good light, let's just go down and, okay, I'm gonna do smooth portrait. And it's too bright. I'm actually gonna darken it down, in this case, by about a half a stop, because this particular preset, and I could choose another, but this particular preset is really popping those skin tones, okay? So I'm gonna go in here, I'm gonna press the R key, I'm gonna crop it a little bit. Here's a quick tip that you can use in both of these. Normally you use white balance to balance your color, but when you're in a black and white mode in both Lightroom and Capture One, you can use white balance to change the entire feel of the scene because by changing the tint in the scene, you're actually changing how all of these channels whether you're in black and white in Lightroom or in Capture One, how they're interpreting that scene. So oftentimes, if you want quick variants to address skin tones and things like that, just play with that white balance slider. And yes, if you went back to a color mode, you're probably gonna have a whacked out white balance. But we're focusing on the black and white edit. Let's go over to Capture One again and take the same photo. I have it right here and I'm just gonna crop it in more or less the same. We don't have to be perfectly, perfectly. Let's go to our styles and again, go down to something like Smooth Portrait. And here we go, the same preset. And again, I'm gonna go to our adjustments and I'm gonna dial back our exposure just a little bit. Now, here's what's happening. And again, I can tweak with our white balance to get kind of different interpretation of how all those colors are being mixed. All right, here's the problem though. If you take this, you could lighten and darken reds, for example, right? But those are gonna dramatically affect skin tones. Or you can go to yellow, which in this case affects the background a lot. The thing is, if we're in Lightroom, we can actually easily come in here and say, no, I'm gonna adjust reds, or I'm going to adjust oranges. Since most flesh tones are in the red or the oranges with a little bit of yellows, what Capture One is doing with their black and white is they're saying, no, you basically just get to edit your oranges and your reds, which are your primary skin tones for most people, all is one. Now, there's a workaround. I'm going to show you that. If I come into here and I do this other portrait, and this, is, this applies in everything, but especially so in portraits, I'm going to apply the Renaissance preset to this portrait. Now, if we go to our color channels, you can see that we have some red and orange differences. Here's the thing, let me zoom in. If I took down the reds, I'm affecting now the reds, and in this case, her lips, without affecting the skin tone that much. The skin tones are mostly within the orange channel and the reds here. Let's go back to Capture One. If I take the same image, I go to Styles, and I'm gonna go down again, I'm gonna go to Renaissance. And again, we have a very similar process, it looks good, but what if I wanna enhance those lips? Okay, so I'm going up here to the color tab. Now I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna turn down the reds, but guess what? Reds and oranges are all lumped in. So what we're actually doing is, yes, I'm darkening the lips, but I'm also darkening all of her skin tones. I need these channels, and the lack of an orange channel is a problem. But in Capture One, what do we have? We have those basic color channels, but we have the advanced color editor. With the advanced color editor, I can use a picker and I can actually say I want a specific color. So in this case, I'm gonna click her lips, right? Even though it's black and white, it's looking down to the baseline of the image and saying, no, what's the color, the actual color? This is an advantage of Capture One. Even though this technically isn't made for black and white, we can still leverage it a little bit because now we can control the lightness of just that and turn it down. Now, if I need to, what I can do is I can make it more specific. If I view selected color range, let me actually adjust this until you can see here, I can move this around, I can drag it, I can be very precise. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna move this until it affects pretty much only the lips and not the skin tones and then just kind of feathers off. Now, let's turn off view selected color range, right? Which is gonna let us see the normal again. Now I can darken just those lips. So you can see if we know our tool, we can get the same effect. And in some ways, in some ways we could do more. 
What Capture One is trying to tell you is, no, you only have these six sliders for black and white. And what I'm telling Capture One is, screw you, I want my color control. I want to actually analyze one of my favorite street photos. I'm going to take a nice contrasty black and white like Fidelity 800 from the, the filmic looks in Silver 4. Okay, it looks good. Okay, let's go to Capture One and let's do that same Fidelity 800 as a style. Okay, so if I go back and forth, we're a little bit lighter in Lightroom, but they both have really good atmosphere. They're both looking really good. I am actually going to darken the Lightroom one just a touch. What I want to do, and we're in Capture One now, let's go to Refine and let's turn off the grain just for now. I would normally turn off the grain if I was going to Photoshop to do more advanced edit because I usually put it on at the very end along with any sharpening that's more than just a baseline sharpening. But without any grain, here's what we have. And you can see if we zoom in very close, it's not bad. I mean, it's pretty clean. There's just a tiny bit of artifacting when you zoom way, way in. This is Capture One. Let's go back to Lightroom. I'm going to go down here. I'm also going to turn the grain off here. And so you can see if we go in even more, uh, yeah, we have some artifacting. Now, this is where people oftentimes come down on Lightroom. I actually did a video talking about worms and details and noise reduction in Lightroom. I'll link that in the comments because they're a dedicated video. The bottom line is Lightroom applies less noise reduction by default. So if I come over to here and also turn off all the noise reduction, now we're in Capture One, you can see that actually some of that wormy noisiness kind of comes back. It's a little bit different, but we're still getting a very similar level of artifacting between the two. Detail-wise, the way they're handling shadows it really seems to be very, very close. The bottom line is here is Capture One, here is Lightroom. In the end, even though there's some more color controls, they're both doing really well. Here's a couple other differences between Lightroom and Capture One that may or may not be relevant to you. If I do any sort of a conversion to black and white in Lightroom, and then I go to the curves, you can see that I'm actually adding a color tint. So I can actually use this to do color tinting. Now, of course, we can go down here and use the color grading tool to get sepia looks and things like that, and that's fine. With the latest updates in 2022 in Lightroom, the color grading tool is actually almost identical. So with the exception of when you're doing really advanced color mixes, like I sometimes do in presets, you probably don't need the complexity of using a color curve, and you can just use the color mixer wheel. However, if we come over here, to Capture One, all of these things you're doing, you can go right down here at any time from a photo that's at zero and just enable black and white and start manually doing your black and white process. You can bring in uh, your advanced color settings, things like that. You, you don't have to have any plugins or any tools other than your main app for anything I'm showing you today. I'm just showing you how I do it. Let's apply that same style here and see what happens with the different nuances of Capture One. So for example, if I just take the Luma curve and darken everything, it darkens it. That's my midtones. I see my histogram here and I'm working just like a curve in any other app. If I go to blue and I'm darkening that, I'm gonna get a very different result because I'm only affecting the blue channel, but it's not adding any color. So understand the difference here. In Lightroom, when I mix those color channels, I'm actually adding color tints. In Capture One, it's completely ignoring the color because what Capture One is actually doing, it's basically putting that on top of everything else. That in Capture One, you can't really use black and white on layers. And people get frustrated sometimes. They think that it's something I've done with my Capture One styles, but it's not. This has been a limitation of Capture One for ages. I've tried to get them to change it so it's more flexible. I don't really see a reason why we can't do a color edit and then add a layer and have that be our black and white edit, but let's look at what happens if we try. Here's my background layer. We have a reset image. If, if I click here and I do a new filled adjustment layer, right? If I'm adjusting the exposure on this and then I turn that layer off, well, what's happening? I turn my exposure off because it's on the adjustment layer. Let's delete that adjustment layer and here's our background. Now I'm going to add an adjustment layer again, new filled adjustment layer. Then I'm going to right click and I'm going to say apply adjustments from custom styles, silver four. Why are all these grayed out? Well, because they're not 
actually available. There's settings that cannot be applied and it's not letting it. Let's not do a preset. Let's ignore a preset altogether and go down and apply black and white. So I'm gonna click enable black and white. No preset style, nothing. Okay, now we have a black and white. You think, oh, it worked. Guess what? It didn't. It ignored the fact that you had the adjustment layer selected and it applied the black and white to your base layer. That's why when you apply a silver preset, a silver style in Capture One, it's only putting your black and white on the base la layer because that's really your only option. It would be nice if Capture One let us do all the adjustments on a layer, although admittedly I don't even use layers that much. I'll use a basic layer here and there. I certainly use the masking layers that are in the latest versions of Lightroom because of the AI masks and they're miles ahead of any sort of auto masking in Capture One as of the recording of this video. But speaking from a strictly black and white perspective, there's nothing wrong. You lose nothing by doing your main black and white edit on your base layer. And then if you wanna add layers for masks, exposure, curves, things like that, you can still do that. And there's other settings as well that don't apply to a layer. For example, if I put a bunch of noise or grain on this and zoom in, you can see I have a very heavy grain. And even though I told it to be applying it to the adjustment layer, it simply ignored that and it's on the background layer. If I turn off the adjustment layer, you can see that nothing's changing on the grain itself and it's still there. Now, if I right click and go to apply adjustments in my custom styles, if I go to something like Filmist, you can see I do have a lot available, but look what's happening when it gets to the black and white, like the Silvex, Delta, the HP5, those kind of things. It's graying out. So you can still run those presets from the styles. It's just gonna put them on the base layer. It's not gonna allow you to actually force those onto a layer layer. So the final question in all this is, where does Photoshop or a layer-based editor like Luminar or something like that? I'm a Photoshop user because it's still a more powerful app, but that doesn't mean that the other layer-based editors out there aren't good. A raw editor, even though we call them layers, is still kind of one layer deep. You still don't get all the complex blending modes and things that you can do. There's something magical that happens when you know how to use Photoshop and you can do more in-depth edits and you start building up those layers and you start creating atmosphere. This is something I cover quite a bit in my Photoshop my Photoshop fast course. But let's go back to this one and take this exact same image that I edited. Here's the Lightroom version. I'm going to reset it. Okay, so we're gonna go here and I'm gonna push that exposure back up just like we did. But I'm gonna take the raw version. Normally, if I was going to Photoshop and I had used a preset, I would actually just use this add color back in preset that's part of Silver 4. Because what it would do is it would leave all the settings and tweaks and dynamic range that I'd put in alone and just restore my color channels. Because by having those color channels when I go into Photoshop, instead of a black and white, I have more control. I was in digital photography early and we had channel mixer and we had the black and white tool in Photoshop. My favorite way to convert black and white in Photoshop is just a gradient map. And this is something that's not actually considered a black and white tool, but when I was doing the study to create black room actions so I could have more advanced black and white editing and make it easier, I said, no, gradient map's the way to go. And I'll show you why briefly, but maybe gradient maps deserve their whole video so you guys see how you can more manually implement them. If I'm doing a black and white in Photoshop, it's because I wanna get a little more complicated. If all I wanna do is go to image adjustments and black and white, there's nothing wrong with that. And I have more or less these same channels, although it's more like the Capture One variant, there's no orange channel. There's nothing wrong with this. It just doesn't strike me as giving me a great advantage. I would rather do that non-destructive edit in the raw editor. What I'm actually going to do is run the Black Room Master Tool. And in brief, what this is doing is building up layers and groups of layers so that I can quickly add edits. It's gonna give me a baseline black and white conversion that you see right here. And you might say, well, that's a little bit dark. Here's the beauty of doing it this way. You can see that I have a base editing layer the starting layer. I have effects where I can control the mix of all the channels. I have a tonal map right here. And this is the big thing here. This is what actually converts everything to black and white is this gradient map right here. I can have exact control over the density of my black and white. Let me show you what I mean. If I go here and I've converted this to black and white and I have a bunch of layers that maybe mean nothing to you right now, but the bottom line is I could say, no, let's add a yellow 12 or an orange 21. And because I built it this way, I can run this action 
and it's going to drop it right in there where it belongs under the other effects. What this also means, even more so, is I can run what I call these light foundry mixes. So if I say, hey, run the earth porn, what this is actually going to do is run a whole bunch of these actions you see here and put a bunch of layers that are landscape focused within this group without destroying anything. So now I can come in here and say, okay, what do I like? I'm gonna turn layers on and off. I'm gonna turn off the sine curve layer and say, no, let's do the super contrast curve instead because I want a little more bite to this contrast. I can go down here and say, no, I wanna add some plates or I wanna add more dynamic range. I wanna add a vignette plate and it's gonna just be stacking them all in here. So I'm not having to build these out. The advantage of doing a black and white here in Photoshop is that I do have all these layers. If I come here and I turn off the tone map, I have this ugly image that makes no sense. The reason it's that way is because of all the effects I've added below. But the gradient map, the tone map here is actually mapping all the edits I did to black and white in real time. The advantage of that is if I go something like this and say, no, I want a full tonal range. No, I want to limit this. I want to compress this so it stops everything at zone zero to zone eight or zone one to zone nine. I want to make it low key. I want to make it high key. You can see this map, which is interpreting how it will show a black and white, how it converts all those colors to black and white is changing each time I click this. I now have all of these different edits and I can control these curves. I can control noise layers. I can say, no, let's do a grain layer right here and put some grain on this image. And then I can go down and control the opacity of that layer. I could double it up. You can decide which one of the raw editing apps is better for you, but a layer editing app for your best images is probably still gonna give you more control most of the time. Even though the differences might be subtle in what I can do here in Photoshop, it is different. It's not the same as layers in Capture One. It's not the same as mask layers in Lightroom. While those can be powerful, they're completely a different animal from layers in Photoshop. And if you don't know how to do that kind of building, at least start playing around with it. All of these apps are gonna give you great black and white, and any of them could be used independently of the other and without the others. You don't have to go to Photoshop to get a good black and white in Lightroom or Capture One. You don't have to go to Luminar. You don't have to do a layer-based edit, but it will probably give you more if you're actually going to print. You don't have to use a raw editor. You can just use Photoshop to edit black and white. I tend to use Lightroom more than Capture One. I find its interface to be a little more intuitive. I like the black and white sliders a little bit. I would like to see Capture One up the game on their black and white controls, but the bottom line is you're gonna get a great result in both. Please tell me in the comments what you think creates the black and white, or if there's other options the beauty of all of these is that none of them require a plugin that's doing magic behind the scenes that you can't see. One of the reasons I love developing tools like presets, like actions, is because we're actually being taught as we use them. Yes, we're saving time, but it's all open and transparent. We can see the layers. We can turn those layers on and off. We can adjust those sliders. Whereas when you go to a plugin, it applies an effect and effectively just bakes that into another layer and you don't have the nuanced control that you do in your native app environment. Please hit that like and subscribe button and we'll talk more about all this stuff and we'll see you guys next time.